Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Lauren Gorn. And I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And today, we're getting enthusiastic about emoji and gesture. But first, my book about internet linguistics is coming out in less than a week from when this episode goes up. Yay! It will be out on July the 23rd, 2019, and it's called Because Internet, and is available in all major booksellers, uh, including an audiobook which you read yourself, Gretchen. Yes, I did. So if you like hearing me talk here, you can now listen to me read the book. Or you can read the book in the conventional way with the words in front of your eyes is also a thing you can do. And I'm really excited to get to share this book with you, to finally get to hear what people think about it. And it is a really good thing to get it when it first comes out, because if it has any likelihood of hitting any sort of bestseller list, pre-orders and sales in the first week are what's going to make that happen. So if you can help us make more people pay attention to the book by getting it on any sort of lists, that would be super cool. This episode is a bit of a taster for the chapter on emoji that's in the book. Which you were kind of involved with, Lauren. <laughs> Which is why we've chosen this chapter, but there are lots of other topics covered uh, in the book. I've been lucky enough to read, uh, and you'll, you'll hear how that went in the episode. I've read this book. Uh, I'm very excited for it. Other topics include things like uh, how we use punctuation to signal tone of voice, the language of memes, and how the first social network you joined influences your internet life. And that chapter, I felt very seen. I've heard a lot of people contact me about that chapter. So because internet, there are links in the description, there are links on lingthusiasm.com. Uh, you can get it. You should get it. I'm really excited to uh, to get to talk about it more with people once they get to read it. In other exciting Lingthusiasm news, we've added a new tier to our Patreon. Several people have asked us, very nicely of you, is there a way that we can support the podcast even more than the $5 a month for the bonus episodes? And now there is. So if you sign up to the Lingphabet tier, fancifully named Ling Portmanteau names, um, for $15 a month, we will assign you your very own symbol of the International Phonetic Alphabet based on our super scientific personality quiz. Mm. <laughs> we had a lot of fun coming up with this quiz. And then we will add your name or name of choice and symbol to our Lingthusiasm Supporter Wall of Fame on the website where it will live uh, as long as you want to stay at that tier. We are also happy for you to nominate your favourite character of the IPA, and we're happy to put any name uh, within reason, so this also makes a great gift for the Lingthusiast in your life. Yes, uh, we're really excited to uh, provide a way for people who have a bit more money at their disposal to help support the rest of the episodes that remain free for anybody to access. So think of this as a way of becoming a, you know, a generous person to support the free episodes, which remain free, uh, and we're, you know, we really want to keep them uh, accessible to everybody. Plus, in celebration of both the new tier and the new book, anybody who joins this new tier by August 15th, 2019, will get a book plate, which is a little sticker that you can put in the front of your book for Because Internet, which is signed by me with your name customized on it. We'll have a form you can fill out. You'll get a sticker in the mail uh, that you can put on your copy of Because Internet. So the two things go together. Or I guess you could put it on your laptop or something if you wanted to. You could just put it in another book. And be like, Gretchen, Gretchen has signed this book for me. <laughs> Stickers are a very flexible thing. Having access to our bonus episodes means that you will be able to access our latest one, which is all about words that only your family use. We had a lot of fun talking about Familex and hearing about all of your Familex in the Familex bonus episode. Uh, so it's a lot of fun. And of course, if you join at the higher tier, you still get access to the bonus episodes. You don't lose your access to anything. Um, it's just an extra thing that you can do if you want to be super supportive. We'll also be recording an upcoming Patreon bonus episode that takes you behind the scenes on Because Internet. So you can read the book when it comes out and then ask us your questions about internet linguistics or what it's like to write a book and tweet them to us at Lingthusiasm or email us at contact at lingthusiasm.com. Both of those are also on the website if you don't have a pen on you right now. Also by August 15th, same deadline for both. And we will answer them in an upcoming bonus episode, so you get to hear all about what it was like to write a book about the fast-moving pace of the internet. So much book excitement, so much Patreon excitement. It's all happening. I'm so excited. Everything is coming up internet. So the reason we wanted to do a very special Lingthusiasm gesture because internet emoji episode was because this is the part in Because Internet where Lauren actually makes a cameo. Yay! 
And the story goes, I was working on the emoji chapter, and I was kind of stuck, and I was complaining about this to Lauren, <laughs> and Lauren very kindly said, well, why don't you send it to me, and I'll read it and see if I have any comments. I was really just wanting to read it, because I was just really excited to see how the book's shaping up. It was entirely selfish. <laughs> well, it seemed very altruistic of you. <laughs> and I remember I had this list of gestures and emoji, and I had so I had like thumbs up and nodding and winking and rolling eyes and playing a tiny violin in false sympathy and high five and giving the middle finger and shrugging and all of these things. So I highlight this list and I'm like, this is like these are all very nice examples, Gretchen, but uh, we have a name for these in in the gesture literature. We refer to these as emblematic gestures, and, and we can talk about what they are. But I kind of just made this passing comment and sent it back to you. And you sent like a bunch of other comments, and they were nice. But this was the one that really stuck with me, because you're something like, I know, you know we have a name for this in the gesture literature, right? Like, And I was like, I didn't know there was a name for these. I was just making a list of gestures that like came to mind. Because when I was talking about emoji, like, I liked gesture as an analogy to what emoji are doing, because gestures and words work in concert with each other. You don't generally just do one or the other, you often do both. And I thought this made a lot of sense in terms of how people integrate emoji with the, the words that they're typing. But I was just making a list of gestures that like occurred to me. And it turns out that what I was also doing without realizing it was making a list of gestures that had common names in English, because that's the kind of gesture that's easy to write down in words. And there's good reason that you did that, because these type of gestures tend to be usable with speech, but they can have a meaning on their own, and they're very culturally specific. So, for example, not everyone uses the, the thumbs up to mean good. Right, because in some cultures it means like sit on this, like it's a, it's a, like the middle finger. It's like a sexual kind of insult. Yeah. Yeah. And I wasn't making the, like, my list didn't include stuff like the gesture that you make if you're trying to like give someone directions or if you're trying to say, oh, like, here's how I got from my home to this cafe. Like I went down this street and then I went up that street and then I went over here. And those kind of gestures that don't have conventional names are harder to describe on the page, uh, harder to describe in an audio podcast. <laughs> uh, but those are another kind of gesture that I wasn't really thinking about at all. And we talk about those gestures that kind of illustrate uh, the speech that we make in our gesture episode, and that's why we did the gesture episode as a video. Yeah, but that's kind of why we did the gesture episode entirely, is because you were like, oh, well, there's a name for this. And I was like, yeah, oh, well, wait, okay. So I'm sitting there kind of Googling, Wikipedia-ing, like, what is this? And I think you were asleep in Melbourne at this point, and so I'm like, Lauren, send me all the things. I want to know more about gesture. <laughs> And if there's one thing I like more than talking to you about linguistics, it's the chance to get to talk about gesture, which is one of my all-time favorite subjects. And uh, so I think I sent you basically like my entire undergrad language and gesture course reading materials. I, I definitely recall a syllabus. Yeah. <laughs> like you've taught courses about gesture and I was like, oh my God, send me all the things. So you sent me, uh, you I know. sent you all the things. So much enthusiasm. <laughs> all the things. And I started falling down this gesture rabbit hole, which was really cool to me because, you know, as a linguist, I'm used to being able to have a conversation with someone and just kind of be sitting there being like, yeah, well, what you're saying is like fairly interesting. But what I'm actually doing right now is analyzing your vowels, <laughs> which is a thing <laughs> that we've all had happen to us, have we not? <laughs> But also, in this case, I could be like, oh, well, I'm analyzing your vowels and I'm also analyzing your gesture. So I'm at a cafe trying to keep working on the book and I'm just looking around at everybody and like analyzing all of their gestures. I always love this point when people start studying gesture and they're like, I just, I just can't stop paying attention to how people gesture. I'm like, yeah, it's pretty great. Study linguistics. It'll render you completely incapable of an ordinary conversation. <laughs> But yeah, it was really exciting. And that was what kind of gave me like, oh, we should actually do a gesture episode. And then Lauren, you were like, well, we have a podcast. This is why I have not suggested that we do a gesture episode. So we ended up doing the video gesture episode because I got so into gesture and it was like, we're going to figure out how to do a video. So the thing that made me really excited about learning about gesture was that it actually explains a lot about how we use emoji because there's a distinction in the gesture between gestures that have conventional names and gestures that don't. And we can see this kind of pop up in emoji as well. And I think this is because emoji are really... Humans want to gesture. I mean, we all gesture. Um, people who have been blind since birth will gesture even though they've never seen other people do it. It's a really strong compulsion in human communication. And I think emoji are allowing us to kind of return having a body to online communication. We always think of, you know, typing and chat as really disembodied. But having options like emoji allows us to start expressing those things that we want to express in conversation again. 
And a lot of times when we think about having a body online, we think about kind of like a video game character picker body where you like you get the hair color and you get the clothes and you have like, you know, the, the haircut and the eye color and these kinds of things and like what, what the figure looks like. But in actual fact, what people are doing with emoji is a lot more li- about what you're doing with your body rather than necessarily having a character picker, like an avatar that kind of like follows you around and like does all this stuff. I mean, you do that in video games, but it's it's less common for, for conversations. And so it was that interesting, like, what role do gestures actually have in conversation? And we have a few decades worth of literature of people trying to unpack this and come up with um, descriptions of the different functions that gesture have. So we've returned to the existing literature in this area that's been researching this problem for years and looking at emoji in the context of that. Yeah, it was really exciting to be like, actually, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's there's this distinction that seems to work pretty well that people may have been kind of subconsciously porting into emoji. So the thing that made me really excited about, so the gestures that have names uh, are called emblem gestures. And emblem gestures are things like thumbs up, you know, middle finger, peace sign, things like that. And emblem gestures have these really narrow constraints for how you have to produce them in order for it to be like the right thing. And my favorite, you know, Canadian Australian cross cultural example of this is like when I make the peace sign, I can make the peace sign my, with my palm facing out away from me, or I can make it with the palm facing towards me, and it's like the same peace sign. It's like fine. No, don't, don't do that. <laughs> don't come to Australia or New Zealand or the UK and and do that. Why not, Lauren? <laughs> because that meaning is basically the same for us as the middle finger is. It's an offensive gesture. That's like up yours, right? Yeah. <laughs> and one of my favorite stories about this is apparently Winston Churchill during World War II. So during World War II, they had this V for victory gesture, which basically looked like the peace sign. But Winston Churchill would often do it, do it backwards. And there's historic records of people telling him, like, Winston, man, come on, you got to stop like flipping off the Nazis. And he's like, no, 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 I'm going to keep doing this. <laughs> Well, no, Winston said, oh, oh, golly, goodness me, I am a posh man. I didn't know that it had that meaning. And then he kept doing um, it, though. In public. And then in private, he was like, yeah, I totally know what it means. <laughs> Um, so gestures have really narrow standards of form. Like you have to produce a peace sign in the exact right way, or it might mean F off. But these ones that have names and standards of form, they also add an extra layer of meaning to what you're saying. So if you say something like good job with a thumbs up versus good job with middle finger or good job with your rolling eyes or a winking or something like this, those mm. all have, they all mean very different things. <laughs> mm. <laughs> like some of those are sarcastic. Some of those is an innuendo. Like, and so as you noticed in that list, there's a lot of, um, because emblematic gestures are so good at conveying a lot of meaning in a single visual form, a lot of them have been made into emoji. But there are other emoji that also have a similar property that aren't gestures physically. Yeah, exactly. And so some of the emoji that became popular in the early stages of emoji, things like the eggplant and the peach and the smiling pile of poo, also seem to act in a sort of emblem sort of way. So if you say good job and then the eggplant emoji, or like good job and then the smiling pile of poo. Or good job and the flame, just to give a like nice positive spin. Yeah, or like the flame to make it positive. Uh, that adds this extra layer of meaning to good job in the same way that adding like a thumbs up emoji or a you know, middle finger emoji adds this extra layer of meaning. But I think importantly, just in the same way that gestures have clear cultural differences between different languages or different communities, those emblem uses of emoji also have really specific communities of use. Yeah, exactly. Like, not everyone knows that people use the eggplant as an innuendo. And if you don't know that, then you might use it in its, you know, literal sense and be like, oh, I'm making eggplant parmesan, here's an eggplant. <laughs> No, dad, don't. <laughs> if you if you search for, uh, I think it's eggplant parmesan, eggplant emoji on Twitter, you see a lot of like younger people complaining about their parents. <laughs> but also, you can't use like a corn or a cucumber to have the same phallic meaning. Yeah, even though like the shape is pretty much the same, but they're not substitutable the same sort of way. Just like you can't do like you know the peace sign backwards and the peace sign forwards are like not the same thing. So these emblematic ones, basically because you can name them, they're easier to spot. But there are other uses of emoji 
Well, yeah, and one of the things that I that I liked about this is that some of the emblems, like like the dancing lady in the red dress, which is just、mm-hmm. officially it's just a dancer, and for a while, a bunch of the different platforms had it encoded as different types of dancers. So, like Google had this like yellow blob with a rose in its mouth, and I think Microsoft had this like disco guy, and Apple had this lady in a red dress, and people got really confused when. They thought they were sending a lady in the red dress, and then their friend got like the blob or the disco guy because they they have these narrow、uh, ranges of meaning. And yet, yeah, these non emblem like gestures they have a lot more room for variation, right? Yep. So, for example, if I'm wishing you happy birthday、uh, in a text message, I might send a few emoji to illustrate that, and you know, I might send a balloon and a birthday cake and the little party popper because it's very celebratory. But I could just as easily send celebratory popper, birthday cake,、um, champagne bottle, because why not? Or like the wrapped gift, or some of these other ones. Oh、uh, yeah.、And、the the birthday cakes, for example, they they are also really different across different platforms. They have different numbers of candles. They some of them are chocolate, some of them are vanilla, some of them are strawberry. They're They're quite different across different platforms, but this doesn't seem to bother people in the same sort of way. And sending someone a birthday cake emoji doesn't really have any additional meaning beyond just like this is a birthday cake. And if you know what a birthday cake is, you can interpret a birthday cake emoji.、It、doesn't have the additional meaning the way the eggplant or the fire or the dancing、uh, girl in the red dress has. And you don't have to send them in any particular order. You don't even have to include those emoji. You could just send happy birthday exclamation mark like a boring monster. <laughs> You could. I've gotten really. I really overanalyze my birthday messages now because <laughs> we've been doing so much analysis of what people use for birthday emoji.、Uh, but yeah, you can send like a whole bunch of different things, and they're all equally birthday-like, which is not true of words. Like if I say "Merry Birthday," I am clearly making a joke. Mmm, that is not the standard greeting. <laughs> if I say like "Birthday Happy," you're like, "Excuse me, what? Sorry." You're you're not speaking English as she is not exactly, and. What I liked about this is that these unnamed gestures, so the gestures used to like, okay, here's the path that I took to get here, or like, here's, here's the you know motion that it takes to catch a frisbee or to throw a ball of this particular size and weight, something like this. Those gestures also have a large degree of latitude for variation. Yeah, we see a lot of、uh, variation in how people use gesture. Whether it is present or not is not necessarily, it's not obligatory in the same way that. Syntaxes, for example. Yeah, there's all this variation, and you don't have as many of the communication errors and problems when you're doing these kinds of gestures that just illustrate what's actually going on. If I send you happy birthday and I put a birthday cake, or I put the gift, or I put a balloon, that doesn't change the meaning the way sending you happy birthday with like thumbs up versus happy birthday middle finger. <laughs> that really changes the meaning there. <laughs> Thanks. Great. <Right. laughs> happy birthday, you annoying person. <laughs> Happy birthday! I hate you. <laughs> But like, happy birthday! Rolled eyes. Like, whoa! Excuse me. <laughs> happy freaking birthday! All right. So yeah, it was it was really exciting to get to kind of break, realize that this distinction between okay, there are some emoji that seem to cast a different light on the meanings of the words that they're associated with, and there's also some gestures that cast a different light on the meanings of the words they're associated with, and there are some emoji that don't seem to change the meaning of the inv- words involved. And also gestures that don't seem to change the meaning of the words involved. They're just kind of this supplementary illustration. And the fact that this distinction seems to exist for both types was really fascinating to me. And then I had to be like, Lauren, can I write you into my book? <laughs> <laughs> Because I figured this out thanks to you. I can't like take credit for inventing this. <laughs> Is it weird if I make you a character in my book? And I mean, it's kind of delightful.、Um, it's kind of a An, an interesting extension of our podcast life, but it also I kind of the more I thought about this in relation to the data that you already had in the chapter, the more I was like, actually, I think we need to do a really systematic analysis of the parallels between gesture and speech and emoji and written language. So I was like, well, how about? We actually write an academic paper together that really drills down into the literature on gesture to see just how far we can take this. Yeah, and this actually solved a problem for me too because I mean I love a good taxonomy. 
Who doesn't? It's just fascinating to... <laughs> who doesn't love a good taxonomy? <laughs> you know, like, here's a way of, of of carving up the world into different pieces that, you know, illuminate some of the differences between different situations. Ah, oh, it's fascinating. But the other thing about a taxonomy is that it does give names to a whole bunch of different areas. And, you know, this book is a pop linguistics book. It is a fun book. Like, fun is in the definition. <laughs> It needs to be fun to read. And the problem with saying, okay, here's this academic taxonomy where we have like six different names for different categories of gestures, I knew I was restricting myself deliberately to one or two new words per chapter because that's about as much as a person can handle. And I was like, no, all the terminology. <laughs> we need all the terminology. And I was like, well, this is great. I agree with this terminology, but I just can't use it all in a book that's aimed at the general public because most people do not have your like decade plus of experience in gesture studies, Lauren. I really hate to break it to you. <sighs> one day. So writing an academic article meant that I could say, okay, here's the kind of basic distinction, and if you want to see more with all the terminology in place, go check out this academic article that we wrote together. And one thing that I really like about the article is it allowed us to revisit some data that you already had and come up with an analysis of how that fits into this emoji as gesture paradigm. Yeah, and it let me solve some of the, the questions and, you know, things that I've been wondering about from this earlier data. So one of the things that was really interesting that came up, so I did a study with a smartphone keyboard app looking at millions of anonymized examples of how real people use emoji in aggregate. And one of the things that we came across really early on in this data, um, so I got them to extract examples of the most common sequences of two, three, and four emoji, because mm -hmm. this is a common thing that people do for large data sets of words, is they'll say, what are the most common sequences of two, three, and four words? So let's try to do the same thing with emoji and see what happens, because obviously we couldn't read individual people's messages. So this is a way of kind of extracting from that um, and figuring out what the common sequences are. So the most common sequence of emoji overall is tears of joy, tears of joy. Right. Okay. The second most common sequence is tears of joy, tears of joy, tears of joy. Okay. Hmm. Do you want to guess what the third most common sequence is? <gasps> I'm going for hmm, tears of joy, tears of joy, yeah. tears of mm -hmm. joy, tears of joy. Y yeah, four of them. Amazing. <laughs> And once you get to number four, I think it was two, you know, kiss faces. So we did change eventually. We did eventually run out of Tears of Joy. And just moved on to more repeating sequences. Turned out we looked at the top 200 sequences of two and then top 200 of three and top 200 of four. And about half of all of these lists was just straight up repetition of the exact same emoji. And this was really interesting to us because a lot of the emoji narratives and media at that point were really excited about the idea of telling stories with emoji of like, OK, if you have like a person and then a, you know, tongue sticking out and then a hamburger, maybe that means a person is eating a hamburger or something like that. But that's not what people were doing. People were doing the exact same emoji a whole bunch of times in a row. And I remember when you did that paper because I was like, oh, huh, that's like that's some really nifty data. But when it came to thinking about this in relation to gesture, there's nothing that really fits that with words. If you look at like the top combinations of words, it's like, and the, I am. There's no repetition. You might like occasionally get a like very, very, um, especially. But it's really far down. Informal conversation. But that's definitely further down than like tears of joy, tears of joy. Um, but if you look at gesture, you often get these repeating movements in gesture, often like an up-down. Like if you ever watch the news without the sound on, you'll just see politicians doing these like up and down repeating gestures. Um, and they're known, These very like podium gestures. They're known in the gesture literature as beat gestures because that movement is so rhythmic and observable. Yeah. And then when I found out about beat gestures, I was like, wait, okay, first of all, it's one of the most common gesture styles. You can observe uh, anybody doing this. If you're in a you know, when I was in a cafe trying to write the book, I'd look over and be like, oh, that person's doing beat gestures. <laughs> like, you don't often see people doing emblems in the wild. Like, for all that they're very exciting, they're fairly rare. Like, occasionally someone will flip someone off or, like, you know, thumbs up or something like that. But it's, like, fairly rare. Whereas you look over to any conversation, you're going to see beats. And I was like, wait a second, maybe people are writing, you know, tears of joy, tears of joy, tears of joy, because that's what they would do in gesture. And it makes sense in terms of the function, because a Beat gesture is often analyzed as being used to emphasize the particular words that they occur with. Mm. And there's something very, like the more, the more tears of joy I send you, 
the funnier I find something or the more heart eyes emojis I send you, the more I completely love something. Yeah, exactly. Or the more like plain heart emoji, even though that's not a face, the more like you love and support something or you want to indicate your, you know, enjoyment of something. Yeah. And so like all this repetition, even when they aren't specifically hands or faces, even though they often are hands or faces, seems to be serving a similar kind of emphatic function as the fact that we repeat our gestures so much. So it was really exciting to be able to drill down into all of these different things that gesture can do and be like, oh, wait, yeah, emoji can do that too. And even those stories that I had been like, oh, well, that's not like real emoji use <laughs> because that's just this like stunt thing that people do. It was like, wait a second, but people do that with gestures too. People play games like charades where they act stuff out in gestures. It's just that it's like, it's not your typical type of gesture, but it's like definitely one subtype of gesture. And it's a, a definitely like in a playful context. Yeah. And people do that. It's a similar sort of playful context that people like try to retell, you know, Les Miserables or something in emoji. It's the same thing as like trying to like, you know, get people to guess, oh, this is Les Mis in gesture as well. And it's often treated as a sort of guessing game where the fun thing is, can you guess what the other person is trying to depict here? Yeah. So I wrote you into this book. We started working on this academic article by the magic of <laughs> how publishing works. The academic article and the book are coming out pretty much the same time. I'm very excited for both. And you're also writing up a piece in The Conversation, which is kind of a more accessible summary of the academic article. So there are lots of different ways to engage with this if this is something that you want to uh, dive into more. I'm really excited that it's our first full academic publication together. Me too, because we've been collaborating on this podcast for so long. And yet, you know, there's an academic collaboration too, which makes us, I don't know, just collaborators on more levels. Just further knitting into my day job. <laughs> I think the most awkward part about this, though, was, so when I wrote you into the book and I had your permission to do that, and I was I was writing this all along, and then I was like, wait a second, I'm going to have to refer to Lauren by her last name, because that's how I refer to everybody else in the book. Like, I'll say their their full name the first time, and then in subsequent reference, I just say their last name. And I can't be like, oh, well, this person, just because, like, we're friends, I'm going to call her by her first name. Like, that's going to be weird. But it's also like, I don't call you gone. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's going to be so weird reading that. <laughs> yeah, like, you're in the index. <laughs> Oh, I'm super excited about being in the index. I'm really excited about everything in that index. There's like two different kinds of sparkle punctuation in the index. Oh my god. <laughs> like the index makes you want to read this book, even though I wrote the book myself. <laughs> um, of course, we've been talking a lot about emoji, but even though like obviously I think it's the most exciting and important chapter in the whole book for like selfish reasons. You're a little bit biased here. <laughs> I'm a little bit biased, and I don't want people to think that the whole book is just about emoji, because there's obviously a myriad of other great languagey things that exist on the internet. So this has really just been a taster of chapter five of the book, which is the emoji chapter. Yeah, chapter five. I have had people say, like, Gretchen, is your book going to tell me what this particular emoji means? And it is not an emoji dictionary <laughs> of, like, here are all the emoji and their cultural connotations, because that's still something that's changing. Uh, that's still something that's in flux. You just, your best bet is still to go somewhere like Emojipedia or Dictionary.com, which is, like, providing, you know, specific definitions and cultural notes about particular emoji. But if you want kind of a bigger story that's less like, here's a list, and more like, here's a here's a bigger picture of you at how emoji actually fit into conversation, and why we're using them, and why they caught on so quickly, and like, are they still going to be around in 50 years or 100 years? That's what's in the book. Plus all this other stuff about internet linguistics, like punctuation and memes. The book is out 23rd of July, 2019. So for many of you listening to this now, it is out in the wild. You can read it. I'm excited for you to have this in your future. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever else you get your podcasts. And you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. You can get IPA scarves, IPA ties, and other Lingthusiasm merch at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. I can be found as at Gretchen A. McSee on Twitter. My blog is allthingslinguistic.com, and my book about internet language is called Because Internet and is available at all good booksellers. I tweet and blog as Superlinguo, and I'm in Because Internet as Gorn, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> to listen to bonus episodes and help keep the show ad-free, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm or follow the links from our website. 
Recent bonus topics include animals, a very cool linguistics job about figuring out how to pronounce all the names on the radio, and direction words like right, left, north, south in different languages. If you support us at our new $15 Lingfabet tier, we will assign you your very own symbol of the International Phonetic Alphabet, and we will recognize your support on our website. Plus, anyone who joins this tier by August 15 will get a very special signed book plate from Gretchen to add to your copy of Because Internet. Can't afford to pledge? That's okay too. We also really appreciate it if you can recommend Lingthusiasm, or Because Internet, to anyone who needs a little more linguistics in their life. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gaughan. Our audio producer is Claire Gaughan, our editorial producer is Sarah Dapirala, our editorial manager is Emily Graff, and our music is Ancient Cities by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic! Lingthusiastic!